Hello, everyone. It's uh, truly an honor to be here among you. It's my second time in Kosovo, and my relationship with Kosovo goes back actually to 1999, where I met my first Kosovar friends at the American University in Bulgaria, uh, whom I love so much and dearly, and it makes me so proud to be here among you. Um, I'm just going to walk you through, through a, a life-changing experience, not just uh, for me, but for an entire nation that was uh, uh, having uh, an appointment with fulfillment of its destiny. Uh, 60 years of military oppression and 30 years of corruption and bureaucracy and brutality of the Mubarak regime had left a nation um, bankrupt of hope. And on the 14th of January, Bin Ali of Tunisia, the first tyrant in the Arab region to fall, the resilience and the valor of the Tunisian people inspired Egyptians to go out on the streets after they brought down the China Wall of Fear. I'm going to share with you some images, but no matter what I tell you, this unique human experience is, is so unique and so special. It was not just political, it was more spiritual. It was a rebirth of not just a generation, but a nation. There's a lot of myth about the Egyptian revolution, that it was a Twitter revolution, it was a Facebook revolution, it was a youth revolution, it was actually a puffer revolution. Those were tools to mobilize people. On the 14th of Jan, the next day uh, after the fall of Bin Ali, I saw that there's a, a movement calling for people to go out on the 25th of January, which is the police day in Egypt. And people marked that day because they wanted to send a statement to the regime that for no longer will they accept police brutality and corruption, which had reached every aspect of our lives in Egypt. So people really cared so much for those tools, but they were not the drive. The drive was people's uh, feel that they need to change their lives. They no longer can accept um, people eating from the garbage, one million kids on the streets, and uh, you know, anyone is not really secure from police. People always ask about the role of women in Tahrir Square. Women really stood out and voiced themselves. You know, the Tahrir Square is, is, uh, was an, a very unique experience. And I don't like to reduce the revolution to Tahrir. There were many Tahrirs all around Egypt. But Tahrir became a symbol of reclaiming the public space. You know, for so long, people, uh, we were living under emergency law for over 30 years. Three people cannot congregate or more in a public area. So this tyranny had ruled our life for so long, people reclaimed that space of Tahrirs. And Tahrir became a symbol for people regaining that space all around the world. You see women who are veiled, women who are not veiled, Muslims and Christians voicing out, crying out for freedom. The first day we went out was on the 25th of January. And the first calls, we were chanting peacefully, Aish, Hurriya, Adala, Iktima'iya, and Karama Insaniya, which means bread, social justice, human dignity, and freedom. By the end of the day, we were being shot at by the police. And soon, the calls were, the people want. And this iconic chanting became uh, so, uh, it became the call of people all around the world. The people want. The people want because for so long, everything was decided for them. They were out of the equation. Women were marginalized and always stereotyped. And forced to do this or that. Now, women go out in public and voice themselves, whether they're veiled or not, whether they're Muslim or Christian. They had multiple roles. They nursed, they fought, they threw stones, uh, they delivered speeches, uh, and they were an integral part of this revolution. Now, what really makes this revolution so special, it is the first revolution in the history of mankind that was a, a peaceful revolution and was able to bring about change. All revolutions had a lot of blood, 
uh, entailed when they made those revolutions. But the Egyptian masses went, went out on the streets and specifically on uh, Friday, 28th of January, after the Friday prayers, we started rallying up. I took five members of my family to the prayer. And after that, people were just waiting for someone to lead. And I started chanting, the people want the regime to be ousted, Mubarak to be ousted. And when I was eight, I saw this film um, about uh, the re revolution in the 1800s against Napoleon Bonaparte's occupation of Egypt. And, the, and one of the callings or the chants was, Egypt will always stay dear to me. And I always did demonstrations at home ever since I was eight. You know, I ke kept chanting that because I couldn't do it on the streets. And I found myself chanting it. And 200 people got, you know, gathered around me, and we were all in tears while chanting. We don't know why, but it was deep down, imprisoned in our hearts, and it just broke free. And this was the real victory. The victory was not that Mubarak's regime fell, that we regained our freedom. This is our country. We used to say it's Mubarak and Ali Baba's gangster's country. Now it's our country. We, our self-esteem was very low. We always criticized, you know, Egypt this, Egypt that, the people of Egypt will never be. And I hear a lot of that resonating when I walk around the streets of Kosovo. People have this sense of frustration of the system failing them. And they, they, they lash themselves and they criticize themselves because they feel they're not part of the system. And this is where you need to take the change in your own hands. No one is gonna empower you. You need to empower yourselves. Now, when we walk out on the streets, the psyche of the masses takes over. You no longer become an individual. You become uh, part of that wave. It's like you become part of the ocean, but you have the strength of the ocean. You don't feel like a weak individual. You, you feel like you have the power of the ocean. I remember young men between the age of 12 and the age of 18 were in the front lines throwing themselves in front of danger. They used their bodies and the fight was so intense. Every second there was a tear gas canister thrown at them, but they were so resolute. And, that, and yet with all the shotguns, the fire, the, the bullets, they were not violent. They did not turn violent. And whenever someone wanted to, everyone would collect others and gather and say peaceful, peaceful demonstrations. We were being fired at and young kids would go up there and intimidate a group of hundreds of soldiers. This is how brutal the police used to be throughout the past 30 years. And little by little, it was the police who was afraid of the masses. They will no longer be able to stand in front of those masses. My five family members and I collected 200 people and we walked over 23 kilometers. By the time we made it to downtown, we were somewhere between 20 to 30,000. We used very interesting techniques. We used to stand in front of buildings and you'd see the men in the balconies and we'd stand in front of them, you know, 10,000 people standing in front of your balcony telling you, calm down, we want to bring back your rights. So people just, it kept growing rapidly. You see one man breaking a whole line of trained police forces. They trained to oppress until they themselves were fed up. They started running away and seeking uh, you know, refuge at houses and people helped them, although they were the oppressors, but they were the victim themselves. Okay, now when in Tahrir Square, the military made it to the streets so that since the police left the scene completely and the Egyptians are so intelligent in communication, 7,000 years of communicate communications, they, they perfected the art of communication. They made a very strong statement. They told the military, we're not afraid of your tanks. Although they were sent by Mubarak and later on said we were there to protect the people. They told them we are not afraid of your tanks and we'll burn them if you're against us. And you see this guy sleeping for hours inside the tanks or people dangling from the turrets of the tanks. And writing statements and they even burnt one tank when they delivered live ammunition to the police and they no longer are afraid nothing can stop this message was so strong and so powerful to this tyrannical regime 
And then came uh, the thousands of thugs that were hired by the Ministry of Interior to protect the Mubarak regime so that it would appear like they are pro-Mubarak people. They were called in the media the pro-Mubaraks. And they came in with camels and with horses and they, the, the, they butchered the people around. But there were thousands of people giving up their lives for those people not to regain uh, Tahrir Square. It was a fight over Tahrir. But Tahrir was the symbol, the symbol of freedom, the symbol of a united nation. You see, the fights were night and day. First three days, I slept 15 minutes. And it was, it was an overwhelming experience. I always uh, said it was one-on-one -on -one to governance in the Independence People Republic of Tahrir. And it was so beautiful, such an amazing experience because people shared everything. You'd wake up in the morning and you'd find a 60-year-old guy sleeping next to you on the pavement and stuffing you with food in your mouth. And people were so angelic. Muslim Christians, when the Muslims are praying, the Christians would hold hands and protect them and vice versa. We, every Friday we had a Juma prayer and we had a, a, a mass with a choir. Around 1,500 people lost their eyesight, and 1,000 people got killed, and over 12,000 people got injured. That's in the first 18 days. But this united us. It defeated every force of evil until this nation was victorious. Now, maybe we have now a parliament. We have, uh, we're having a, a presen a presidential elections in a couple of days. Uh, maybe you don't have a perfect parliament, then we might not have a perfect president. But I think the fulfillment, the real fulfillment, is in the generations to come. And I'll share with you the story of those two little monkeys there, Yassin, seven-year-old, and Marwan, five-year-old. Uh, their mother, the, first of all, they're the founders of the revolutionary monkeys movement. And their mother tells them a story every single night. And one of those times, the little one had to run to the toilet, and his mom stopped. So his eldest brother looked up to her, and, she sa and he said, the people want the story to continue. <laughs> and just in case she didn't get it, he told her, by the way, those are protests. <laughs> as funny as this may sound, but it's another strong, powerful message that this revolution has been institutionalized and embedded in those young kids' culture. Kids play in the streets now instead of police and thieves. They, they play revolutionaries and police. And when those who are playing the police fire at the revolutionaries. One of them would fall and they would all carry him and start saying the martyrs are the loved ones of God. And they've demonized the police so much, but it's the free, free spirit of the revolution that will continue in, in the streets of Cairo and all over the world. Let me share with you that what I think <coughs> is going on is not just that. It's not detached from what's happening in Spain, Greece, uh, and all around the world. We've seen the civil liberties uh, movement in the 60s. They planted the seed in our generation. Yes, they managed to make the world a bit more tolerant, but the real product of the 60s, I have a dream project, was our generation that believed so much in that change. The difference is that they didn't have a vision. They've had a, they had a dream. We have a vision. We want a much greener world. We want more peaceful world. We know exactly what we want. Our challenge is we don't know exactly how to get there. And this is, I believe, it's the responsibility of our generation is to get together and discuss what we want in the future and how to get there. I'll leave you with a short video of kids playing revolution at the schoolyard to remind you of the spirit that will continue, the fulfillment, uh, the sandertin.
the teachers freaked out big time. <laughs> To tell you the truth, this is nothing but an effort. What's happening here and all around the world is to counter that neoliberal, aggressive consumerist culture that was imposed on humanity with the new world order after the fall of the Soviet Union. This neoliberal, aggressive consumerist culture had left the world with more greed, hunger, more war. And this is what this generation is all about. We're standing against this effort. We're bringing back our human dignity. We want to live as human. And I believe this is our time and we will fulfill our dreams. Thank you.